Hi, welcome to this presentation as part of today's postgraduate virtual learning open uh, virtual open day. Um, my name is Anne Marcus Quinn and I'm the course director of the MA in Technical Communication and E-Learning here at the University of Limerick. So over the course of the next um, 15 minutes or so, I'm going to go, go through an overview of what the program involves and why you might be looking at pursuing a master's in technical communication and e-learning, what you can expect to study, um, looking at some of the topics that you will study as part of one of our modules. So that includes layout and design and learning materials, but I'm actually going to go through um, kind of a bird's eye view of what one of our modules covers. I will then introduce you to one of our graduates, Jess Beely, who will give you um, a report from her perspective and her experience of the programme and um, some further information and contacts. And then we'll have a question and answer session at the end. I'm not going to go into too much detail here about the University of Limerick physical campus, but it's good to note that it is um, a very beautiful amenity. And we're very lucky to have it on our doorstep here. So when we can all finally get back on campus, we can again enjoy um, what's offered to us. So why might you be looking to undertake a master's in technical communication and e-learning? Well, um, you can study in an innovative, enriching student-centred learning environment. We have fantastic resources available to students. The library has had a huge investment in the last couple of years, um, making it one of the nicest libraries I think that I have been lucky enough to put my foot into. Um, all of our faculty involved in the programme are very engaged in cutting edge research and we are research our, our teaching is research led so you can be assured that you are receiving the very best in terms of information and practice of what is out there we also offer a very flexible delivery format so we offer a fully online course and um, we also offer a blended and face-to-face now, obviously, things have changed in the last few months with COVID-19, but we have been online for the last few years, so we are established and um, the students have had very positive reports on our course. Our course also offers very high employment. Um, it compares very well to other courses nationally and internationally, and many of our graduates go on to work with um, very successful companies. We have strong international academic links as well, with all members of faculty working with international colleagues, again, in cutting edge research. The course, um, the MA won the postgraduate course of the year in both 2018 and 2019. We didn't apply for the um, award in, uh, in, um, this year in the humanities and social sciences category, and the graduate certificate has also been shortlisted in the past for this award. So what can you expect to cover during your programme of study? Well, we look at key design principles for instructional material, and now more than ever, high quality digital materials are critical to student success and um, successful student learning. And that doesn't happen by accident. It's a, it's, it is a discipline in and of itself. You will also um, engage in critically evaluating design and the development of software applications. You will be introduced to a range of multimedia applications and we use Web2 technologies to collaborate with peers. You'll also experience how to manage complex writing and design projects. And you will learn how to communicate effectively in online and face to face environments. And you will also learn how to write clear, correct and precise content. And again, that is critical to uh, technical writing, that you be very precise in your writing. Many students may have fossilised mistakes when they come and start the course that they're not even aware that they're making. And over the course of that first semester, um, they will have the opportunity to uh, get to, um, I suppose, have a spotlight shone on aspects of their writing that they may not have thought about in years, or maybe they just didn't have the opportunity in the past. We have a detailed um, information pamphlet on the programme, which is available online at the following links. Um, as I said, I'm the course director, and if you are an international student and may have separate queries, you can direct those to the international office. 
international at ue.ie or postgraduate admissions that speak queries about the fees and so on. And we also have um, a blog which features information on the student experience of the MA in technical communication and e-learning. The next slide just covers some of the social media channels associated with um, the faculty of AHSS and so on. Now before I go to Jess, what I want to um, go through very briefly is a taster of what you can expect to be introduced to on one of the modules on the programme. I didn't want to do a taster lecture because it's very difficult to identify a small aspect of the content that we teach and take it out um, and treat it in an independent manner because as they say sometimes a little information is dangerous. Um, I don't think that you can separate some of the key content and principles that we cover without having done the foundations and so on so I didn't want to get into that but what I do want to um, tell you about is a little bit more detail about the first module which is common to both the grad cert in tech technical writing and the MA. So on that module, the, uh, it's split into two halves uh, effectively. The first half of the module looks at uh, writing. So we will cover an introduction to technical communication, you know, what is this field of study, what does it entail and so on. We will also look in depth at audience analysis and why the audience, why knowing your audience is so critical to writing um, appropriate information. and how we learn to write in more concrete terms rather than writing in more abstract terms, which is easier content to produce. And it's what most people will write without thinking too uh, much about what they're actually working on. We'll also look at rewriting as a topic. So typically this is taking a longer piece of text and looking at how you can uh, shorten this so that it is appropriate to a particular audience um, and their needs and what they need to gain from it. We also look at style and credibility, so different types of writing style and what is appropriate for a given audience. Again, audience is a theme that runs right throughout that module. And we look at style and credibility, so we look at the types of um, style that different documents will require. We'll also look at summary writing and again this is a really important aspect of uh, technical writing, technical communication that many people don't think about and yet it can be a job in and of itself. So there are different types of summaries. Um, so we have informative summaries and descriptive summaries and we're lucky enough that we have a great network of connections with um, as members of the Faculty of Technical Communication and I will usually ask someone who works as a professional summary writer to give a guest lecture here as well. So in addition to the a lecture that I would prepare and deliver, you will also hear from someone who is working in the real world as a summary writer. And that's really useful as well. We also look at the topic of typography. And again, this is really crucial to how a message is conveyed to an audience. So it's not just the content, it's how that content is conveyed. So what is the most appropriate form of typography to choose? Maybe you've got a very young audience or and you've got an elderly audience where you need to take issues um, such as eyesight or uh, into account. So it's a very rich topic and again we cover different aspects of it. And again we have connections with uh, typography departments um, that are uh, based overseas. So we're lucky enough to be able to draw on that expertise. In the past, we were again lucky enough to be able to bring someone over from the University of Reading and we had a typography workshop. So we will try to have guest speakers who are experts in a very niche area when we can, in addition to the content that we prepare ourselves. At this point, the, we start to look at the visual representation presentation of content and uh, data display and so on in the module. So we start to look at graphics and again, I will try to get a guest lecturer if possible. So in the autumn that we do a uh, module that I just uh, we finished, I uh, had one of the designers of the Irish passport give a talk to the master's class. So he talked about how they had arrived at specific design features um, that they used in the passport, both to convey information and from a security perspective. So that was really interesting as well. 
We also look then at data display and how different types of graphics can be used. So a lot of the time people don't give much thought to whether they'll choose maybe a pie chart or a bar chart or so on to display quantitative information. But that's really important, particularly when you're maybe working on an annual report or if you're in a small to medium business and you have to produce legal reports and so on. It's a really effective way of getting that, um, that data across. So we look at the different types of graphics and uh, what is more appropriate for the different types of quantitative data display. Um, we look at colour as well, so the role of colour in layout and design and which colours work, uh, the importance of a colour palette and so on. We look at a little bit of the history in terms of production of colour and documentation and how that may be slightly different depending on the medium you're using. So whether it's hard copy or whether it's online delivery. And again, you're taking all of this into account then when you're building a document or creating something for online delivery. The last um, topics that we cover on this particular module are writing instructions. Again, some people will go on to work on instruction manuals. This is critical to what they will need for the workplace when they graduate. Others not so much, but again, it's a key skill of a technical writer. Um, and we look at brochure design as well. And again, all of the all of the topics that we cover on this module are the key principles. Of, of technical communication. So you'll be drawing on all of this as you move through the course. So in the spring, when you're creating a digital learning resource, you'll be drawing on all of that theory and pulling it into practice. So everything that you've done, you're laying a very strong foundation um, that you will be building on when you are going on to create your uh, resources and building up that very personal portfolio of uh, material that you've produced. Um, I don't want to go into the detail of the, I suppose, technical detail in terms of when you do each module and so on, because you can get all that from our, the full time structure, which is detailed on the program outline online. So I think at this point, um, I'm going to hand you over to uh, Jess. Um, we're very lucky that Jess is available today. Jess Beely was one of the graduates from both the Grad Cert and the MA from a few, a few years ago. So. Thank you, Jess. Hi, thanks, Anne. Uh, so my name's Jess Beely, and uh, I was looking for a change in career, so I decided to do this master's in 2018. And um, since I'll talk a little bit about the actual um, classes themselves, but um, since, graduate, since graduating, I got a new job as an educational technologist in UL. So my job is to assist the lecturers with putting their course materials online and creating a cohesive faculty wide approach to um, online learning, which, as you can imagine, is quite a busy job at the moment. So this course was completely invaluable to me. I use it every single day, the information I use every single day, and um, I wouldn't have been able to get the job that I have without it. Um, so a little bit about the classes, um, I think like Anne mentioned, they're taught um, online um, or in class. So I actually went into classes myself, but on the weeks that I couldn't go to a class, I would um, do the online um, version and there was really no difference between the two. Obviously, these lecturers are really um, experienced when it comes to teaching online, so they, they know what they're, they're doing. They're, it's really clear um, everything that you have to do each week. Um, materials are released on a weekly basis and you decide when you engage with the content. So it's really flexible course. Um, there's also a weekly live chat usually with your lecturers. So if you have any specific questions, you know that you can ca catch them in a particular hour during the week. Um, and all of our lectures were really helpful um, and approachable. Um, there was never an issue with asking questions, that kind of thing. So Anne has already talked quite a lot about the course content, but um, basically you'll use everything that you learn in the course and the assignments that you actually create are really practical. So um, for each assignment, you generally end up with a completed product, which you can add to your portfolio um, to show to future employers. So the kind of things that I did during my course, now that it might be slightly different for you, you might choose to do, uh, the, the assignments might be slightly different, but the kind of thing that I did was, um, I created an instructional podcast, an e-learning course, resources, website, screencasts, video, all different kinds of things. And all of those things are things I actually use in my job at the moment. So they're really helpful. 
Um, you generally, lecturers leave it up to you to decide on a topic for your course. So for example, if you're doing an e-learning site, you can decide what you actually create it on. So for example, you could do it something to do with your own job, something to do with a future career you might be interested, um, or even a hobby or something that you might enjoy yourself. And there's also a research element to the course, so you'll get a really good grounding of the theory of design and communication, and you get to practice writing a research paper and doing a literature review. review. Um, and we will also do group work as well, um, which is interesting when you're doing it online, especially at the moment, you'll, you know, you'll get a really good experience of collaborating online um, with other people. So for our project, we um, collaborated with students in Paris and Florida. So obviously there's time differences that we all had to work with. We had to decide which tools and technologies we used to collaborate as a group. Um, it was a really, really good experience. Um, and then at the very end of it all, you create your last assignment is to create an e-portfolio, which is just um, an online portfolio showing the kind of work that you've done, which, you, like I said, you can show to a future employer. Um, and then during the summer, there is a thesis as well. So um, you either do a dissertation or a project. Uh, you can do a, a research dissertation or practical project. I was delighted to find out you could do a practical project because research isn't really my, my thing. Um, so for my own dissertation, I created two different things. I created an online orientation co course for students and I created a resources um, and tutorials for lecturers on how to use a virtual learning environment. And both of these pretty much got me the job that I have now and they're being, they've been um, used extensively since. Um, so it's really amazing to see that my dissertation that I did last summer is being used by students and lecturers now. Um, the kinds of tools and technology you use um, during the course, it, now it depends completely on the project that you're doing, but I use, for example, uh, Dreamweaver and Audacity to create podcasts and articulate to create an e-learning course. Uh, in our group project, we use Skype and WhatsApp. We use WordPress for blogging, which reflected blogging. Um, created screencasts with Screencast-O-Matic. There's loads of different things that you do. And there's also a Twitter assignment that you do, which is actually really great for networking as well. Um, and then so finally, just um, I think pretty much everyone from my cohort of students has been employed now. Um, like I said, I've got a job as an education technologist in UL, which was the job that I really wanted when I went into this course. So it was really great to have all the experience that I had in this course and to get the job I wanted afterwards. But I think some of my classmates are um, employed in instructional design, technical writing, content development training, that kind of thing. So overall, it's really flexible, really rewarding. And I think if you enjoy writing content and design and technology, you'd really, really enjoy it. So thanks. That's excellent, Jess. Thank you for being such a great <laughs> ambassador. Um, I see some questions there in the Q&A that I'm um, just going to address. I see the first one there, I'm undecided about doing the MA or the grad cert. Could you advise on that, please? OK, so basically there are four modules on the Grad Cert um, that are common to the MA. Uh, the Grad Cert is something that you can take. Um, it's over two years, so it's one module per um, semester. And if you decide that you have enjoyed what you've done, you can carry on to do the Masters. Um, we changed the content on the Grad Cert a couple of years ago because we had quite a few students coming through from the Grad Cert wanting to uh, carry on with the MA, but not all of the modules were common. So you can get, um, basically, you you don't have to repeat the modules. So you can um, get an exemption for three of the four modules that you've completed on the Grad Cert, um, so that when you do the MA, you don't have to do all of the modules that are on the MA. So I hope that that addresses that question. Um, I see another one here. I work full time. Can I do this course online? Yes, you can. Um, I would recommend if you are working full time that you take the course part time. Um, it's a very intense course, as Jess has attested to, and it really does take um, quite a commitment um, on a weekly basis. So if you are if you have a busy life, if you are working full time or have a busy family life, I would really strongly recommend that you do the course part time. That is enough of an undertaking. Every year I get students who have signed up for the course to do it full time over one year. 
and if they are working full time by the end of the autumn semester, they are usually requesting um, to um, to go to part time and we can't always offer that or it isn't always possible. So I'd say it's really important before you register that you decide which um, is the best option for you. So if you're working full time, take the course part time. Any other questions? I see here there's um, a question what mul what multimedia apps do we use and I think Jess had um, had covered this a few minutes ago but we would constantly um, review which software tools are being um, sought in the jobs market okay um, and then we would uh, look to what we are offering and make sure that there is a match. So when FrameMaker was appearing in all of the ads or many ads, uh, we would we would have covered that. And now we're moving more towards covering Madcap Flair. Um, the Adobe Suite is still very much sought after as a graduate skill. So we include some of those software tools on the course. So again, we would really keep abreast of what is industry standard and try to include that where we can on the course. I can't see any more questions at this time. Are there more questions? Or student numbers limited? Yes. Um, we only take in about 20 odd um, in terms of full time students and about 20 part time. And I know that we are reaching our full capacity in terms of full time students. So but we still have places available on the part time or more places available on the part time. See, there's another question here. Are some of the modules a repeat of what some students may have taken in their undergrad degree? OK, um, they're not so much. Uh, no, they're not a repeat. There might be common topics, but you will cover content in much more detail at the postgraduate level. Likewise, what is expected in terms of the assignment brief? It's much more um, intense at the postgraduate level than the undergraduate. You will have gotten a good taste of what we do and it will probably come easier to you as a result, but um, it is quite a different experience at a, as a postgraduate student than an undergraduate. Um, can I give examples of where graduates end up working or the type of industries? Again, Jess touched on this, which was really helpful. Um, our students go everywhere. <laughs> A lot of our students in recent years have um, ended up working as educational technologists and it's great to see that as a growth area because as more and more courses and, and um, uh, education is moving online, we there is a recognition that that doesn't just happen, that you it need it is a profession, it needs to be treated as such. So we do see that there is more of a recruitment happening for our education technologists and instructional designers. So many of our uh, graduates end up in that area. Um, again, we get many who end up as technical writers working for some of the larger firms such as IBM or SAP. Um, and again, it's a small community here in Ireland. So many of the um, people working in technical writing, they will have come through our course or they will know if people have come through our course. And one of the assignments that we have tended to keep as a staple is that uh, we require students to go and interview someone working in an area related to technical writing or instructional design or e-learning. So often people will really, really leverage that assignment and they will identify someone or a role they want to end up with. So they will go and they will talk to someone in that role. So it really helps them to shape what they work on then is maybe their MA dissertation or their MA project to make them more attractive to that company or to um, or to end up in that kind of role. Um, can online students access the library? That's an interesting one. And it's, it's actually um, a lot of the reading that we will try and um, prescribe is available um, online. So you will have journal access and so on as a distance student. But there is also a programme 
um, where you have access to the university network in Ireland to their libraries as a registered student of a full time course. So we have distance students, for example, uh, based in Dublin who will be able to go in and use uh, their local university library if they have one of those. I think it's a Sconnell card. So that has worked out really well. We've actually had students based in the UK as well who've been able to access their local university library on that scheme. So that has worked out really well. And the library has more information on that. Um, another question here. Would there be any more, would there be any opportunities to meet and interact with potential employers within or after completing the course? Well, um, as I mentioned earlier on, we do try to get experts in to speak to the students. It makes a huge difference to meet people working in, I'm going to quote here, the real world. <laughs> um, so it's, it's good to have that connection. Um, one example of that is that we have um, people come in from small to medium enterprises um, to speak to our students. Sometimes they will recruit uh, students from the course. And in the last two years, we've had people recruited for e-learning roles um, in this manner. Just seeing if there are more questions here. Would a Chromebook using online apps be sufficient to use for coursework? Um, I'm not sure. I would say maybe for something for the some of the Adobe uh, tools, they might need a, a larger spec than a Chromebook to run them. Um, but again, that's something that you can investigate online. Most students will have a laptop or a, a, just a standard machine at home. But if you're purchasing a laptop, I'd advise you to go for the, the best model that you can with the best memory or the, the most memory available to you. Do you have to buy your own software licenses? Um, some students do buy a software, the student uh, software package for the Adobe tools, but it's not required. Um, if you choose to use something like Articulate for your summer project, particularly, there's a very generous um, trial period available for some software like that. You could always go down the route of using open software for some of your um, for some of your work as well. Um, but yeah, there is the option to to use the trial software in some instances. Um, I think Jess, there's a question there for you. Did you do the course part time or full time? I'll let you take that. I'll just mute myself while you do that. Yeah, I hope you can hear me. So um, Anne mentioned the graduate certificate before. Um, I completed that in 2014. So I came in technically as a full time student, but because I had exemptions for those modules as a part time student. So I did uh, one module in the first semester and three in the second semester. I was working full time. Obviously, the second semester it was quite full on, but um, but it was it was manageable to be able to work and study at the same time. OK, thanks, Jess. That's that's really helpful. I think that's possibly the, the most common question I get asked. Should I do the course part time or should I do the course full time? And I feel uh, like I'm repeating myself over and over, but it's really important to hear if you have a busy life, it's really important that you realise how much work is expected and how intense it is. There is no terminal exam. It is all continuous assessment, which means that you are kept very busy for the full semester. So it's really important that you take bear that in mind when you are choosing whether you can do it full time or not. The application deadline is the end of June, but like that, uh, we have accepted a lot of students already. So if you do intend on applying, I'd recommend you apply sooner rather than later. What documents are required when applying for this course? Um, there is a full detail on the application um, when you start the process of what is required. Um, just having a look through the questions to see if there's anything there I've missed. Oh, what is the average weekly time commitment when studying part time? OK, again, this is a question I get asked every from most prospective students. It's a really difficult one to answer because the course is um, so mixed. We get a very varied backgrounds uh, in terms of our student intake. So for someone who is coming straight from a 
agree and maybe has um, worked out a kind of a timetable of how they work and study and source materials or so on, they won't have to spend as much time getting into that new routine as maybe someone who's returning after being out of work or out of the workplace for quite a while. So there isn't really um, an answer to that. It really is how long is a piece of string. But um, if you look at how ECTS uh, credits are, are how they are marked out and the time associated with each one, I think it's about uh, between 10 and 15 hours a week that you would be spending per module. But again, it depends completely on your own circumstances. Some people may be coming from a related discipline and they might uh, be more aware of the research or the reading and so on. So it's not such a big jump. But for people who are coming in where it's completely new to them, the reading may be more onerous for them. It, it really is a very personal um, a response to what work they, you have to do or how much you have to commit. Um, again, just having a look through the questions here. What criteria are used for selection if it's oversubscribed? Or is it for it's first um, first served as begin as because we have to accept students throughout the year. I don't wait until June 30th and then start assigning places. Um, so as I said, if you plan on applying for the course, I'd recommend that you do so at your earliest convenience. What technical background is required before entering the course? Um, it is a conversion course, so we don't um, expect that you would be very technically proficient. Um, most people will um, know how to use the, uh, the Microsoft Office suite and may not know anything beyond that. That's absolutely fine. If you think that you are not, um, or if you think that you may have difficulties, I would recommend that you take something like the ECDL before you start the course, because it will give you a bit more confidence in terms of what you can do, and, and um, it will be a good kind of foundation for you before you'd start. How many spaces are left for the full-time course? I don't know offhand um, how many are left, but I, I know that we are nearing capacity. But we have more availability for the part-time course at the moment. Just looking through the questions here, I don't think there's anything new there. No, so I, th I think that's um, that's that's really it. The, the employment is quite good, as Jess um, made reference to. Out of last year's class, all of the students that I would have supervised, they're 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 in work. Anyone who is available for work is in work. Um, and again, we, because we are online for the last four or five years, um, it's an established course in terms of online delivery. So I think that it's an attractive option for many people. OK, I think that's it, unless anyone else has any questions. Thank you.